ceremony of the Elizabeth Ann Seaton chapter of the National Honor Society. My name is Josie Meeks and I am the current president of our chapter of the National Honor Society. Tonight we will celebrate and showcase some of our current members and the accomplishments they have made while also inducting a group of 11 new members who continue to embody the four pillars of the National Honor Society. I will begin the ceremony by lighting the center candle which represents the light of knowledge and truth. Our Elizabeth Ann Seaton chapter of the National Honor Society was established in 2005 and we are pleased to induct these 11 students into our chapter to join their fellow members in the National Honor Society. We will have Kendall Davis come up to lead us in our opening prayer. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Gracious God, thank you for bringing us together this evening. Your Son, Jesus Christ, calls each of us into a relationship with you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You call us individually, and to strengthen us in our earthly journey, you give us companions through groups and organizations. Send your Spirit upon us. May our National Honor Society be an instrument of your grace and a source of strength. Bless all who are a part of this ceremony. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Thank you, Kendall. As members and inductees of the National Honor Society, we can learn from the enriching history of our chapter and the organization, but can also apply these values to our future. We are the people that will continue to strive for character, scholarship, leadership, and service as we pursue our new opportunities. It is our responsibility to use these God-given abilities that have been bestowed on us to better the world around us. As current members of the National Honor Society, we are working in our school to improve and create new opportunities and projects for the future members to pursue. We are the people that decide the future of our school and community, and we will use the tradition of moral and ethical responsibility found in our own history to make a brighter future. Ella Berger will now come up to give a brief history of the National Honor Society. Many of us here about the NHS are not fully aware of its purpose and place in schools across the country. I will present some of the history and discuss some of the symbolism of the NHS. The NHS was established in 1921 through the National Association of Secondary School Principals. The establishment was in response to a growing movement at that time in high schools in the United States to place undue emphasis on athletic and strictly academic activities. As a sign of its success, today's NHS has over 16,000 chapters with opportunities for service activities, national and state conferences, leadership camps, scholastic competitions, and scholarships. The first NHS chapter of Seton Catholic was almost 20, year, 20 years ago in 2005. There was one year that we had two members inducted and it has now grown to 182 inductees and now the 11 that we have here tonight. As with any society, there is a degree of tradition and symbolism. The NHS's official insignia is shown on tonight's program. The outline is that of a keystone. As a builder places a keystone to hold the perfect arch in perpetual stability, so too the structure of our lives must be held firm by the principles represented in this symbol. The torch and certain candles used in ceremonies are traditional symbols of knowledge and truth. The bottom of the keystone contains four letters. CSLS, which stand for the four fundamental principles that the NHS deems most worthy of encouragement. These principles are character, scholarship, leadership, and service. The official colors are blue and gold. The official flower is the yellow rose. The official motto is noblesse oblige, and noblesse oblige is a French phrase that translates as nobility obligates. The phrase has its origin from times when people were customarily born into nobility or royalty. Ethical behavior of those times stated that those who were born with wealth, land, or power were obligated to serve those with less. But that tradition can be traced further back. Back to Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. A parable concludes with Jesus' words. Much will be required of the person entrusted with much, and, and still more will be demanded of the person entrusted with more. 
Let us remember the ethical and the moral meaning of the motto, Noblesse Oblige. Thank you, Ella. We will now have current members who have displayed excellence in a particular pillar light a candle and share a few words about each of the four pillars. Blair Whitty will begin by lighting the candle of leadership. is leadership. Today, as I look around the room, I see a common quality in each and every one of you. Leadership. Dictionaries define the word leadership as the position, capacity, or ability to lead, guide, or direct. To be a leader means so much more than just having a title. It means staying accountable and responsible, being passionate about your beliefs, doing what is right, and setting an example so that others can be influenced to do the same. We all have the ability to be a leader. As I said, leadership is not about the title that we hold. It is about the qualities we have and the actions that we take. When we think about great leaders, many, time, many names come to mind. Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, Winston Churchill, Jesus Christ, and so many more have set the tone for what a leader can be and what they can accomplish. One thing all of these leaders share is their ability to stay persistent and passionate despite all of the obstacles in their way. Their resilience and hunger for righteousness are what continue to inspire us today. Students, as you approach adulthood, you will be faced with many challenges. There are always going to be obstacles around every corner. Not everyone is going to be a follower or recognize the valuable qualities that you bring to the table. However, we must all find a way to peacefully persevere in order to reach our goals and be the best version of ourselves that we can be. So, students, I strongly encourage you to challenge yourself by leading by example, taking on the passion of a leader, and trying to become a better person each day. I congratulate you all for being inducted into the National Honor Society. This is the perfect opportunity to demonstrate your skills as a leader and set an example for the younger students here at Seton Catholic. I know that all of you have the ability to impact the lives around you, and I hope that you will carry this ability into your senior year and beyond. As the candle of leadership burns, I will leave you with the words of Jack Welsh. Before you're a leader, success is all about growing yourself. When you become a leader, success is all about growing others. Connor Kitchen will now continue by lighting the candle of character. What is character? Character is the combination of morals and personality traits that make you you. One can shine through physical attributes, but what will truly put an individual above the rest is character. Over time, this is what people will see and attribute to one's success. By staying true to one's morals and beliefs, by being kind and outgoing, by being determined and hardworking. These are things that, when put together, build character, and these are the attributes that everyone will see and admire you for. Great character creates great leaders. Today we are here to congratulate the new National Honor Society members because of their character, which allowed them to outshine the rest. Not only did these new inductees display acts of honesty, integrity, and courage, but they lived out these traits so well it was noticed. Now that you are about to enter into the National Honor Society, this is an opportunity to really let your character burn bright and be seen by many. This is a chance to make a difference, and I'm sure you will not waste it. With the new inductees' outstanding character, I am sure the National Honor Society has a bright future ahead of it. Congratulations to all who are making their next step into NHS. I would now like to invite Tessa Hamilton to continue by lighting the candle of service. Greetings NHS inductees. As you commit to the National Honor Society, you also commit to a demonstration of true service. Service is defined by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary as the occupation or function of serving or contribution to the welfare of others. 
At the most basic level, this does hold true. Yet, when looking in depth into one's own service, we can't help but realize that service goes much further than this. Service is inherently a way to give and show love for others. From acts for a community of strangers you've never met, to doing a simple favor for someone close to you, service has a profound impact on all those involved, in both, in both practical, physical ways, and in spirit. Service comes in all shapes and forms, and there's no such thing as bad service, unless, of course, you're referring to your cell phone in the gym. As Elizabeth Kubler-Ross states, as far as service goes, it can take the form of a million things. To do service, you don't have to be a doctor working in the slums for free or become a social worker. Your position in life and what you do doesn't matter as much as how you do what you do. Service can be as simple as reaching out on social media to a classmate who seemed upset or sending a caring card to a grandparent in a nursing home. Of course, it can be as broad and significant as a mission trip like Catholic Heart Work Camp or a massive fundraising project. But it is not the scale of these acts of service that shows their true value, it's the impact they have on even one person's day. While service does have an impact on the individual who completes it, such as increasing one's happiness or improving character, the basis of service is what it does for others. I implore you to think of doing things in your life not just for you, but for those around you. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Students, I ask you the same, what are you doing for others? How might you make a difference to someone else? So how do you so service in your life? Maybe you dedicate your time towards helping serve at Mass. Maybe you do chores and help with siblings around the house when you can tell your parents are stressed. Maybe you carry a bin around school during every SRT and collect recycled materials, even if you are going to work on homework. Maybe you pay those two dollars just to work for your dress, not even knowing what organization it's being given to. Regardless of how you go about service, it is a profound force of the human way itself showing our love and compassion for all those around us. I leave you with this famous quote by Anne Frank. How wonderful is it that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world? I hope you remember this going forward as members of the National Honor Society. Thank you. Finally, we will now conclude our final pillar by having Kara Berger light the candle of scholarship. Scholarship can often be classified into three different categories. These three categories include commitment to learning, diligence, and effort. A person who demonstrates scholarship not only strives to do their best work no matter what, but they also do it for a higher purpose. One person who exemplifies the true meaning of scholarship is Pope John Paul II. As a part of his effort to promote a greater understanding between nations and religions, he traveled great distances extending his influence beyond the church, campaigning also against political oppression. His emphasis on nonviolent political activism illustrates his true intentions behind each movement. He did everything in the likely image of God. Scholarship is not solely based on being the most skilled or intellectual person. Rather, it is about having an intellectual curiosity that drives you to both enjoy learning new things and having the persistence and integrity to keep going, influencing your peers along the way. This particular pillar can only be achieved through diligence and effort. Each one of you inductees sitting here tonight have already demonstrated these qualities of a scholar. Your desire to learn and grow in your studies is admirable and something to be proud of. We commend you all for your commitment to learning, diligence, and effort. Congratulations on being inducted into the National Honor Society. Thank you, speakers. Shortly, each member will be called by a name to come forth and sign the chapter register. Then light a candle from our knowledge and truth candle to represent that through your gifts from God, you are taking light into the world. Each student will then be presented with a certificate and a National Honor Society pin. Robert Bagby, you have been selected to be a member of the Elizabeth Ann Seaton Chapter of the National Honor Society.
Sophia Coiner, you have been selected to be a member of the Elizabeth Ann Seaton Chapter of the National Honor Society. Mary Dow, you have been selected to be a member of the Elizabeth Ann Seaton Chapter of the National Honor Society. Isabella Deal, you have been selected to be a member of the Elizabeth Ann Seaton Chapter of the National Honor Society. Mason Harvey, you have been selected to be a member of the Elizabeth Ann Seaton Chapter of the National Honor Society. Diego Julian, you have been selected to be a member of the Elizabeth Ann Seaton Chapter of the National Honor Society. Wing cannot attend due to sickness, but Wing Lee, you have been selected to be a member of the Elizabeth Ann Seaton Chapter of the National Honor Society. <laughs> Leah can 
also not attend due to sickness. Leah Miller, you have been selected to be a member of the Elizabeth Ann Stephen chapter of the National Honor Society. Sonny Stanley, you have been selected to be a member of the Elizabeth Ann Seaton Chapter of the National Honor Society. Andrew Warner, you have been selected to be a member of the Elizabeth Ann Seaton Chapter of the National Honor Society. I would now like to introduce Mr. Bill Penley. Mr. Penley was born and raised in Paris, Illinois. He served in the U.S. Navy for four years and taught at Richmond High School for 34 years. He taught history at Richmond High School. He has substituted at Seton High School and the West Building for 17 years. Mr. Penley loves history and people. Here is Mr. Penley. If it's okay with you, I will not use the mic. I learned early in my teaching career not to stand behind a podium. For the most of the times, the podium were taller than me. <laughs> Students had a hard time seeing me. And I don't like using the mic because I also learned that I cannot stand still and talk. When I talk, I move. So the podium is right out there. I have, I'm a small person, but people tell me I have a very big voice. So I think it will be okay. But if anybody cannot hear me, raise your hand, and I'll be happy to move a little bit closer to you. So, here we go. First of all, it's a great honor to be asked to speak at this uh, introduction of 11 new members to the National Honors Society. 11 new members. That is a big deal, a very big deal. And I'll tell you why in a few minutes. I'll give you some numbers you know, to prove that. But for Seeking Catholic School to have 11 members, that is a big deal. Well, as a retired history teacher, any event that I observe or participate in especially, I always look at the history part of it, and I want to know what happened to lead to this event. Who had to do what kinds of things that resulted in this? So, in order to answer that question, I want to do what most teachers, almost all teachers worldwide do. I'm going to give you a test. It's not written. Don't worry about it. It's very simple. Besides, you guys are proved you are very, very good at taking tests. Some of you parents might have to worry a little bit. But the question that you have to keep in mind is this. Who did what? 
that resulted in this ceremony tonight? It's a multiple choice question, so you have several, you know, answers to pick from. Answer A. Let's start at the beginning. Your parents. Well, of course, they had you when you were babies. They took care of you. I won't go into detail, but they changed your diapers and did all that kind of stuff. And before they knew it, your know, time passes fast. Before they knew it, you were ready to go to school. Now they had a major decision to make. What school? There are several choices. Seton Catholic School is one very good choice. Advantages, small school, small classes, very good teachers, highly qualified. One major disadvantage, it's expensive. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. It's very expensive. Some people have no problem with that. Lucky them, and they are the hard workers and the lucky people to have the money. But for most people in Richmond and the Wayne County area, it may come down to something like this. You know, we've got money. We can take a nice family vacation. We all need it. We deserve it. Or we can send you to Seton Catholic School. They chose a very wise decision, as it turned out. They chose Seton. The result is you 11 people are here. That's obviously a good decision. But it wasn't the only consideration. They also could have chosen, and I'll use Richmond High School because I taught there 34 years, so I'm, you know, I'm just used to talking about it. They could have chosen a public school. Richmond High School is a very good school. I never criticize public schools. As in every school, there's advantages and there are disadvantages. The advantage of Richmond High School especially is it's large, it has lots of opportunities. The disadvantage of Richmond High School is that it's large and it has lots of opportunities. If you take the, and make the right choices, you do very, very well. If you make the wrong choices, you can end up very, very bad. So, but Richmond High School, another major advantage is free. Not completely, but almost. Compared to Seton, it's free. So parents had to decide. Vacation and public schools, maybe no vacation or a short one, or Seton. And then there's one other choice which I never criticize either, and that's homeschooling. Not too many parents, I don't think, you know, would have the opportunity or the ability to do that. The advantage of homeschooling is you get one-on-one -on -one with your parents, and you're home with them, and you can really, really bond. The disadvantage of homeschooling is the parent has to have the education, the knowledge, and I don't know that I could do it, the ability to teach a wide range of subjects. History, I can do that. English, I can fake my way through that. <laughs> Math, back in the, when they called it in elementary school arithmetic, Oh, I was good at that. <laughs> Somehow, when we got to high school, they changed the language. They called it algebra. No way, no way was I up to that. So, to have a parent do all those things, science too, I mean, music, the only instrument that I can play, musical instrument, is the radio. <laughs> when it comes down to anything else, I'm out of it. So, anyway. Uh, Seton schools, public schools, homeschooling, your parents chose Seton, and it turned out for you very, very well. So, parents have done a great job. They have given you, throughout your life, unconditional support and love. And you can't really do without that. Okay, well that's answer A. Answer B, Seton School. And I'll use the high school as an example because that's what you're in now and that's what, again what I'm kind of most familiar with. So, what are the advantages of the school? When I'm not talking about the building, you mentioned 
most people in Richmond, um, the uh, Seton Catholic schools, and they think of the building. It's oh, it's, it's that, that isn't that the one down by the cafeteria? That that kind of thing. I'm talking about the people in the school, the teachers, and I'll include the principal and the administration at the same time that run and operate the school. What decisions did they make and what did they do that came together for your benefit? Well, when they were in high school, you guys are juniors and seniors. When they were in high school, juniors and especially the seniors, they had to make a decision. Now, at your level, you may think, oh, that's an easy decision. Do I go to college or do I not go to college? But for many, many students, that's not necessarily an easy decision, that college is just automatically in their future. The advantage of not going to college, you can get a job that pays you money. If you're a 17 or 18 year old kid, to be paid is a big deal. It allows you to go out and buy things that you've always wanted without your parents' permission, to do things that you've always wanted without your parents' permission. I mean, you're kind of on your own and you're making your own living. That is a great opportunity. Plus, you have a whole lot of fun doing those things. Now, if you go to college, it's almost the exact opposite. You're used to in high school working hard, studying hard, writing papers, taking exams. Guess what? In college, it's exactly the same, only it's worse because it's harder. Here you have the support of the teachers, the small classes and that kind of stuff, individual attention. In college, you may have classes of, of uh, especially in the freshman year, two, three hundred students, some guy up on the stage with a microphone. Uh, he doesn't know you, you don't know him. You can kind of come and go, pay attention, go to sleep, doesn't really make any difference. Uh, so, no, that's, uh, that's kind of a disadvantage. It's, it's education at a different level, and much more of the responsibility is on your shoulders. So how you respond to that, plus, is very, very expensive. Instead of earning money, you're spending money. And you're spending a lot of money. Thousands and thousands and thousands per year. And it will take you four. A lot of times today, students, it's not unusual to take five years to get a four-year degree. You come out of college with two Ds. Debt and a degree. Many college students will spend years after graduation paying off the debt. But you've got that degree, and now you can go out into the world and get, hopefully, a good job uh, and making money. Now, back to uh, the teachers here. They have made the decision, I'm going to school. Good decision. Now they have to decide, what am I going to major in? They decided education. I can hear their parents. What? You want to be a teacher? <laughs> the lowest paid profession in the country. We're spending all this money to allow you to be the lowest paid person in the country. Are you joking? And they said, no, no, no I, I want to be a teacher. They persisted, they went, and they became teachers. Good for them. Then they had another major decision. Where do I teach? Public school? Well, the pay is low. Or private school, well, the pay is really, really low. Lower, much lower than the public school. So they decided on Seton Catholic High School, and here they are. Oh, they made decisions, and they paid the price. They sacrificed for those decisions. But the result is they were here, they were dedicated, they taught you, and they taught you well. Oh, the school, the teachers, they deserve a lot. That's answer B. Answer C. I don't want to forget. There was an answer D. Sometimes I forget that. Answer C. 
Well, that's you guys. I know what you've been thinking for the last 10 minutes or so. Wait a minute. This is about us. We did all the work. We wrote the papers. We did the studying. We studied and took the test. And here he's talking about all those other guys. Well, I'm going to talk about you just for a little bit. When you came to see maybe you had a choice, maybe not. Maybe you, your parents said, well, what do you think of going to see me? Or would you like? Or maybe they said, you're going to see me. Well, okay, so you did what you're told, and the decision was made. So here you came to see me. Now you have decisions to make. You can be an excellent student, or you could be a good student. Ah, oh, you could be a mediocre student, or you could be a horrible student. An example of horrible students, uh, I've seen a few. Um, they do nothing. Sometimes they come to class and sometimes they don't. Uh, they never study. They don't care about school and they especially, I had one guy walk into class, first thing he said was, I hate school and I hate history. I said, well, welcome to history class. <laughs> and he sat down. So, and, and we got all fine after that. The guy was <laughs> honest and I appreciate honesty. Uh, anyway. So, now, they can, not good students, they can do that kind of a thing, they can not study, they can even be disruptive. While a teacher is talking, they could, what, do email, text, I don't know what you guys do anymore. Because, you know, I, that's, that's new stuff to me. I don't pay any attention to that. I don't even own a smartphone. Some people say, well, how can you get along without a smartphone? I said, oh, it's easy. I live in the 1980s, and I love it. And I don't want to join the 2000s. But anyway, back to you guys. You did not choose any of those kind of things. You chose to be excellent students. When I assign a chapter for students to read, actually, it's more than that. Student, if you read a chapter, and a parent would ask you maybe an hour or so later, what was that chapter about? Oh, you might be able to make a comment or two, uh, remember a thing or two. Excellent students don't read chapters. Excellent students study chapters. When you read it, you think about it, you analyze it, you understand it, and you remember it. And that is hard work. And that is what you guys have done. So, you know, we're very, very proud of you. So, you and your hard work, it pays off. Three choices on the answers. And now, part D of the answers. When I ever, whenever I gave multiple choice questions, I always had to, usually four choices. Part D to this one, all in the above. If your parents weren't great parents, would you be here? Maybe, but probably not. If the teachers were not great, caring teachers, would you be here? Maybe, but probably not. If you weren't great, hard-working students, would you be here? Definitely not. It takes all three of those categories. If any one of them doesn't work, more than likely, you're not going to be here. They all work, and you are here. Well, now that you're here, let me give you a couple of statistics. I said earlier that this is a great event, an accomplishment for you, for the school, because, first of all, nationwide, one in five students that start high school as a freshman never graduate. Twenty percent will drop out before graduation. So just by being a graduate, you're in the top 80 percent. But how many students are invited to join and join the National Honors Society? I've read a couple different articles and they came out with slightly different numbers, but it comes to something like this. Around one in 30 or 
one in 35 who will become members of National Honor Society. That means you put together at Seton, juniors and seniors, which is around the mid 30s in numbers, we should have this year one student qualified for and joining the National Honor Society. How many do we have? We have 11. More than 10 times the national average. I think, Seton, you, your parents, you have done more than an excellent job. You have done, I hate to use the word perfect, that means there's never any improvement. I suppose we could have 12. But near perfect perfection, and it results in you. Congratulations. I'm proud of you. And again, thanks for asking me to be here. When uh, Mr. Reitley first asked me to come, I said, well, how long should I speak? He said, oh, maybe five minutes up to a maximum of 13. I did not time myself because I hate to do that. I almost know I went over the 13. But anyway, uh, I was happy to be invited and proud to be invited. And thank you very much and good luck. Well, by the way, since now you're members of the National Honor Society, when you fill out college applications, Make sure you put that in there someplace. I'll guarantee you colleges pay attention to that. When you get out of college and you apply for a job, put that someplace in writing or in your conversation. I'll guarantee you bosses and owners of factories and jobs will pay attention to that. You have joined a very small select group. Congratulations and thanks. Thank you, Mr. Penley. You will find the pledge on the National Honor Pledge of the National Honor Society on the back of the program. I invite tonight's inductees to stand, and all those who have been inducted in the past to stand and say the pledge. I pledge myself to uphold the high purposes of the National Honor Society to which I have been selected. I pledge to strive in every way by word and deed to incorporate its ideals into the ideals of my school and life. You may now sit. We will have some closing remarks and prayer from Deacon Jim. Afterwards, we'd like to take some pictures of the inductees and members on the steps in the atrium. And everyone is invited to stay for some refreshments and fellowship in the cafeteria. Unlike. Unlike Mr. Penley. I can stand behind the <laughs> ambo here, and I use a microphone so I don't startle anyone that might be dozing off. Because as the kids know, I can get loud. It's an honor to be here this evening in the presence of the students, the cream of the crop. But I'm not going to go on and on about them, because I'd be here till next week sometime. But what I will do is close in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, O oh Lord our God, we thank you for having gathered us together this evening in your name to induct new members into the St. Elizabeth Ann Seton chapter of the National Honor Society. We thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us we thank you for family and friends and the love you shower upon us. We thank you for these students that we have honored here tonight and all those that came before them. 
We thank you for having blessed these students with gifts of scholarship, leadership, service, and character. We also thank you for the blessings that these students have been to this school and this community. Lord, we ask that you help them to grow in your love, your kindness, your compassion, so that through them and all the members of the St. Elizabeth Ann Seton chapter of the National Honor Society, they can make this school a better place for every student to learn and grow in character and love of you. Help all of us gather here to realize that you love us far beyond our wildest imagination and will always love us until the end of time. And we ask all of this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Deacon Jim. Inductees, please make your way to the atrium for a picture. Thank you.